Welcome everybody. Um, welcome to today's uh, webinar. Today we're going to be talking about uh, GLMs and HGLMs in Genstat. We are joined by the lovely Vanessa Cage. Uh, thank you, Vanessa. Um, Vanessa has, well, Vanessa, we've been working together, working with Genstat for more years than I care to remember. <laughs> yeah, a long time now. <laughs> yeah, it has been a long time. Um, so today, the recording will be sent to you after um, after the event, after the after the webinar, and you can feel free to share that. And um, we're also going to share with you free thirty day access uh, to a GLM course, Genset GLM course, um, so you can you know have a bit of real time practice after the webinar. Um, as I was saying to the guys, feel free to say hello in the chat. Let us know where you're from. Any questions? Please pop them in the Q and A area. Um, it's quite a full webinar, so if we don't have time to attend to those questions today um, during, during the webinar or after the event, we will send a follow-up email and we'll answer those questions um, in the follow-up email when we send you guys a recording. Without further ado, over to you, Vanessa. Excellent. Thank you so much, Sir Kerry. Um, I'm just going to hide my um, video for the moment because I, I Puts me off a bit of when I can see myself. Anyway, thank you very much um, for joining um, this webinar today. And it's a real pleasure to talk to you about generalized linear models, generalized linear mixed models, and hierarchical generalized linear models, and how to fit these in Genstat. So this webinar is in two parts. First, we're going to have a little look at the theory to help us understand the relationship between these different types of models and when we might use them, starting off with ordinary linear models. But don't worry if um, theory is not your thing because we won't linger on this for too long. As in the second part of this webinar, we're going to work through some examples live in Genstat. Now, after this um, webinar, if you want to look through the theory we're just about to cover again, you can find it in one of the blogs on the VSN website. So just go to vsni.co.uk, click on the blogs tab, and you'll find this blog quite high up in the list. Okay, so many of us will be pretty familiar with linear models or linear regression. Now, a linear model can be used to model normal data with a single source of random variation, the residual error. So in a linear model, the observed response Y is equal to the mean response predicted by the model mu plus the residual. Or in other words, the expected value of the response variable is the mean mu. And of course, the residuals are assumed to be normally distributed with mean zero and variance sigma squared. Now the mean mu is modeled by a linear combination of the explanatory variables, as shown in this expression here, where the x's are their explanatory variables, or the predictors, and these betas are the regression coefficients, or the model parameters. Now this model can be written more succinctly in this matrix form here, where the X is the model matrix for the explanatory variables, and this beta is a vector containing the regression coefficients. So here's a very quick example of a linear model, modeling blood pressure with age as a predictor. And this model predicts that blood pressure will increase at a linear rate on average by half a unit for every additional year of age. So now let's look at generalized linear models or GLMs. So these are very powerful tools in statistics for the analysis of non-normal data, such as counts or proportions. And as we'll see, they are essentially an extension of linear models to accommodate non-normal distributions for the response. 
So as with linear models, the expected value of the response y is the mean mu, but now the response can come from any distribution in the exponential family. So along with the normal distribution, amongst others, this includes the binomial distribution uh, for modeling proportions, and the Poisson distribution, which is commonly used for modeling count data. In addition, and very importantly, the underlying linear model now defines a linear predictor, this eta expression here. And this linear predictor is related to the mean response mu via a link function. It is this link function that defines the transformation required to make the model linear. So due to its special properties, often we use the canonical link function to the distribution of the response variable. And indeed, this is the default in GenStat. However, sometimes um, for scientific reasons, we might use a different link. So for example, for binomial data, the canonical link is the logic. However, for scientific reasons, it might make more sense to use the probit or complementary log log link. So here's a simple example of a GLM. This time we're modeling the number of students awake at the end of the lecture using the duration of the lecture as a predictor. In this case, the number of students awake out of the number attending is assumed to follow a binomial distribution. And the logic link, which is the canonical link function, is used. So on the right here is a plot of the fitted relationship with the observed data on the scale of the linear predictor. So that's on the logic scale. This is the scale where the relationship is linear. However, often we'd like to see this relationship on the original scale or the natural scale, which in the case of binomial data is proportion, as shown in this graph here. But notice now on the scale that the relationship is no longer linear. linear. So this brings us to generalized linear mixed models. And they extend GLMs to allow for more than one source of random variation. So this allows us to model additional sources of random variation, such as blocking effects. So once again, the expected value of our response variable is the mean mu. And as for GLMs, the underlying linear model defines the linear predictor. But this is now extended to include one or more random terms. That is the expression for the linear predictor now includes this additional term, where ZJ is the model matrix with a jth random term, and VJ corresponds to its vectors of random effects, which are assumed to be normally distributed with mean zero and variance sigma j squared. So here's a simple example of a GLMN, modeling the number of nematodes in a plot after treatment with one of four different fumigants. And here the data is from a randomized complete block design. So the response variable is the number of nematodes per plot, and this is assumed to follow a Poisson distribution. The canonical link function is the natural log, and the explanatory term in the model is the factor fumigant, which has four levels. And there's a single random term, the factor block. Therefore, the linear predictor contains a single Z matrix with a column corresponding to each of the different blocks in the randomized complete block design. So from this model, of course, we can get estimates of the means for the four different fumigants on the scale of the linear predictor, so that's on the natural log scale. And 
Often, of course, we want to transform these means back to the original scale. So we can just simply back transform them to get the mean count of nematodes per plot. Now let's move on and have a quick look at hierarchical generalized linear models or HGLMs. Now if you recall, GLMMs, the random effects assume to be normally distributed. HGLMs extend generalized linear mix models to allow for the random effects to be non-normally distributed. So as for the three earlier modeling frameworks, the expected value of our response is still the mean mu. And as for GLMs, the linear predictor can include additional random terms, but these aren't constrained to follow a normal distribution nor to have an identity link. So that is the random terms now have their own link function and the vector of random effects can follow a non-normal distribution. For example, the beta, the gamma, or the inverse gamma distribution. But what distribution and link function should the random effects have? Well, as it's mathematically and intuitively appealing, often we use the conjugate distribution to the distribution of the response variable y. So for example, the conjugate distribution to the Poisson distribution is the gamma distribution, and the canonical link function is the natural logarithm. But don't worry, um, you don't have to um, remember this, because in GenStat 23, we've made it really easy for you to specify that you want to fit a conjugate HGLM with the canonical link function. So using the same example before, the conjugate HGLM would simply model the random block effects using a gamma distribution and use the natural log link function. Now GenStat, it offers a very comprehensive set of tools for fitting these types of models. And that's now what we're going to move on to. Um, due to the interests of time, unfortunately, I won't be covering um, linear models, but there is a lot of help available in the GenStat regression guides and in our tutorial videos. And also, as Kerry mentioned, if you are interested in a more in-depth course on the theory of GLMs and HGLMs, with loads more examples of how to fit these analyses in GenStat, I do encourage you to check out um, Roger's e-learning um, course on this topic and we'll share um, the link with you to this after the webinar. So let's fit a GLM, a GLMM and an HGLM in GenStat. Now the data we're going to use is from an experiment to test whether a ryegrass endophyte, that's a type of fungi that lives within the plant, provides protection against a common insect pest. Better protective plants grow larger and produce more tillers. Thus, the response of interest is the number of tillers on the ryegrass plants. Two different ryegrass cultivars were tested, both infected or not with the endophyte, and in the presence or not of the insect pest. So that is, we have three treatment factors, endophyte, positive or negative, cultivar A or B, and insects present or not. And every combination of these factors was studied in the experiment. So our treatment has a, has a factorial structure. And the experiment had a randomized complete block design um, with seven replicates. So in GenStat, we are going to fit three models. We'll start by fitting a Poisson GLM, but rather than just ignoring the replicate effect, um, which is not a good thing to do, we'll include it as a treatment term in the model. Then we'll fit a Poisson GLMM with replicate fitted as a random term. And finally, we'll fit the conjugate 
Poisson HGLM, assuming a gamma distribution for the random replicate effects. Now there's a little nuance to this data set in that the response variable is censored, um, which I'll talk about a bit later. But one of the many new features in GenStat 23 is our ability to analyze um, censored Poisson counts. I wanted to demonstrate that um, here today as well. Okay, so that's the end of our really quick intro to the theory. Let me just switch over now to GenStat. And here we go. Okay, so the data set we're going to analyze is one of GenStat's built in example data set called Sensor Counts. To open that, we just go to File, Open Example Data Sets. And then we search for censored counts. When it comes up, click on it and click open data. So here's the data here. In the first column is a factor giving the replicate, that is the block and the randomized complete block design. Now I know it's a factor because we've got this little red exclamation mark here, and the column header has this pink background. Then we have three treatment factors, cultivar, endophyte, and insect. And lastly, we have the response variable, which is the number of tillers per plant. So let's model this count data using a GLM, assuming a Poisson distribution and using a log link. So we'll start by opening the GLM menu. Go to stats, regression, and then generalized linear model. Okay, we can use this analysis drop down to select a specialized GLM to fit. For example, a Poisson GLM with a log link, the model that we're going to fit, is also known as a log linear model. So we could select that here and we'll get a specialized menu for that. However, for the purpose of demonstrating kind of more generally how to fit JLMs and GenStat, let's go back to the general analysis menu. Okay, so firstly, the response is tellers. So I'm gonna move my cursor focus into the response period field and double click on tellers to move it there. Now the model we want to fit is replicate plus cultivar by endophyte by insect. Now including an additive term for replicate enables us to adjust um, for potential replicate or block differences. And the asterisk symbol separating our treatment factors is the cross product operator. So cultivar, asterisk, endophyte, asterisk, inset, means we're fitting the main effects of these three factors plus all their various interactions. So all their two-way interactions and also the three-way interactions. Now the distribution of the response we are assuming is Poisson. So I select that here, and we'll use the canonical link, the natural log, which GenStat selects automatically for us by default. Now this maximal model field is used when we want to compare the model we're fitting to a more complex one. And we're just gonna leave this blank and simply fit the most complex model that we want to consider from the outset. Now, at any time, if you want to know about any of the settings on any menu, just click the help button and it will open the help um, dialog for that um, particular menu. Okay, so now let's click on the options button and this will open a new menu, the options menu, where we can select various items of output to display and also control certain aspects of the method used to fit the GLM. 
So let's um, display a um, summary of the model, a cumulative analysis of deviance, the Wolds tests, and the F probabilities. I'm also going to make sure that fit model terms individually is ticked so that regression models will be fitted one term at a time. And this will mean that the accumulated analysis of deviance we've requested will contain a line for every individual term in our model. And finally, let's also estimate the dispersion parameter rather than fixing it at one to allow for over dispersion. Now I'm going to leave all the model fitting options at their default. And yeah, again, a little reminder if you need to know anything else about any of these settings, you've got that help um, button at the bottom of the menu. When we're happy with the options, we just click OK and then run and our Poisson GLM will be fitted and the output we've requested will appear in the output window. So at the top of the output window, we have got a summary of the model that we have fitted and underneath is the accumulated analysis of deviance table. Now this tests the significance of each model term as they are sequentially added into the model. So for example, the test of endophyte represents the effect of adding this term to the model already containing the two terms above it, cultivar and replicate. Now in practical terms, importantly, this means that the order of fitting matters. You will get different values in this table when you fit the terms in a different order. So for example, if I change my model here to fit um, the cultivar, put the cultivar term last in the three way interaction, the order that my main effects are fitted will change. So if I click run, you'll see where previously they were fitted to cultivar endophyte insect. Now they are fitted endophyte insect cultivar. And this will affect um, the values in that table. Okay, and next we have the wool tests for dropping non-marginal terms from the full model. Now, a term is marginal to another term if all its factors and variates also occur in that term. So for example, the insect by cultivar interaction is marginal to the three-way interaction because both the factors insect and cultivar occur in the three-way interaction. Anyway, let's just have a little look at our accumulated analysis of deviance table and the Wolds tests. Both of these are really indicating that there's not much evidence of a three-way interaction, but it does appear to be an important endophyte by insect interaction. Even if I scroll up to this earlier table, where we're looking at endophyte by insect after all the main effects and the other two-way interactions have been fitted, it is still highly significant. So to explore this, let's have a look at the means from our model. Now to predict means, we simply click on the predict button and the prediction menu will open. To output the full table of cultivar by endophyte by insect means, we simply click on each of them in turn, and this will move them into this field here, which lists all the factors that predictions are going to be made at. Now using this back transform drop down, we can choose whether to 
back transform the means to the original count scale or leave them on the scale of the linear predictor. So let's back transform them to the original scale by selecting back transform link. Right down here in the left corner in the display pane, we can choose what output to print. So let's print the predictions along with their standard errors and their standard errors of differences. We can also plot our predicted means by checking this plot table of predictions box there. Now, if we just click run now, um, GenStat will create its own um, view of the pr plotted predictions, but we can control how they are plotted by clicking the options button. And this will open another dialog here. So let's plot inset on x-axis and we'll use the factor endophyte to group or color our means and we'll trellis or divide the plot by cultivar. Oh, wrong field. Let's delete that out there, sorry. So I want to trellis it by cultivar. And I'm going to plot it as lines, and I do want to include um, error bars showing the standard errors. So we click OK and run on the predictions menu, and the predicted cultivar by endophyte by insect means on the back transform scale will appear in the output along with their standard errors. And in this little table here, we can get the standard error of the difference between um, two back transform means. And if I bring the graphics viewer going to the front, which briefly popped up, here is our plot. Okay, so from this graph, I guess it's pretty clear the negative effects from insects on ryegrass plants that aren't affected um, with the endophyte. So on average, there are fewer tillers on plants without endophyte when insects are present than plants that are affected um, with endophyte. So endophyte does appear to be providing some protection against insect damage. Okay, so before I think we move on to GLMMs, there's a couple of other buttons on the main menu that I want to mention. So the save button allows us to save various results from our analysis. So for example, if you wanted to save residuals, you'll just check residuals and give a name for the object that you wanted to um, save it in in the corresponding field. The change model menu button, sorry, opens a menu that lets you assess different models by either adding or dropping terms from the current one. So for example, we could have drop our three-way interaction cultivar.endophyte.inset, drop that and look at our output um, to see what um, the effect of that was. And as, 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 as we were aware, it, it, um, it's not significant. So we're probably pretty safe in dropping that from our model. The other button is the further output button, and it opens a menu that lets you display additional output and also some um, graphs as well from your analysis. Okay. So now, in our GLM analysis, we have allowed for potential replicate effects by including this term in our model. But, of course, 
there might be some useful between replicate information that we're wasting. Now, if we fit replicate as a random term using either a GLMM or an HGLM, we can potentially recover this inter-replicate information and increase the precision of our estimated treatment means. So let's see how to do this by fitting a GLMM. So there is two ways to open the GLMM menu. You can either go stats, regression, mixed models, and then pick it from here. Or you can go straight to mixed models on the stats menu, and then you'll find it down at the bottom. And both these routes open exactly the same menu. So as for the GLM, our response variable is tillers, and we're assuming a Poisson distribution, and we're going to use the log link function. But now our fixed model is just cultivar by endophyte by insect, with replicate now being fitted as a random term. So we select replicate as the term in our random model. Now as for GLMs in the options menu, we can select various items of output um, to display and also control um, different uh, aspects of the method used to fit our GLMM. So let's display a description of the model, estimate of the variance component for the replicate, um, the wall test for the fixed effects, the means, and the back transform means. And also, once again, we're going to estimate um, dispersion. Just a wee thing, I'm actually going to enter into this box the three-way interaction here, cultivar dot endophyte dot insect. So by doing this in the output, just the table of three-way means will be displayed. Now, if I leave that blank, we'll get all the means, the one-way means and the two-way table of means for, and the three-way table of means for all the different combinations of cultivar, endophyte, and um, insect. But if I just want the three-way means, I can specify that by typing the interaction in there. Okay, I'm going to leave everything else at the defaults. Happy with those options now. So I'm going to click OK and run. And the output for our GLMM will appear in the output window. We've got a summary of the model being fitted, estimate of the variance components, estimate of the dispersion parameter, our wall test for the fixed effects, and the tables of means. Okay. So, um, what was I going to do now? <laughs> so, yeah, so once again in our output, there um, does seem like there's strong evidence of a um, endophyte by insect into reaction. So um, once again, let's have a look at that by plotting the predicted endophyte by insect means. I just click on the predict button. Oops, sorry, I double click, that's why it beeped. I want to select endophyte and I want to select insect. And once again, I would like to plot these. I'm going to choose plot table of predictions, and then I'm going to click the options button so I can control how my graph is created. So this time I'm going to produce a bar chart and I'm going to include standard errors on that. On the x-axis I'm going to plot insect and I'm going to use endophyte as the grouping factor that colours the bars on the chart. So click OK and run. 
and there is our plot of the predicted means. Now, importantly um, to note that these means are actually plotted on the scale of the linear predictor, so they're plotted on the log scale, not on the back transform scale. But once again, it's pretty clear that um, there are fewer tillers on plants with the in, on plants without endophytes when the insect pest is present. Okay, so another thing that I quickly want to show you is that it's always a good idea to inspect the residual diagnostics plots to help us assess the fit of the model. So to do this, we can go to further output and then click on the residuals plot button and this will bring up another menu. Now, residuals for a GLMM and indeed an HGLM come in two flavors. There's the residuals that combine all the random terms. That is, they include the residual error and all the random terms in the model. So in our case, this would be the residual error and the replicate fix. And then there are the residuals, which are just the pure residual error, which we can select by choosing final random term only. So let's plot these. We can also choose whether to present the residuals on the scale of the linear predictor or back transformed to the original scale of the response. Now the advantage of plotting them on the scale of the linear predictor is that the diagnostic plots have the usual interpretation. So um, let's just do that and not back transform them. Click run and here's a graph of the residuals on the scale of the linear predictor. And these have been standardized by defining each one by its variance. Now, provided we have a reasonably large data set, the residuals should look like residuals from a normal distribution. And therefore, we should be able to assess the fit and model assumptions in the same way from these residual diagnostic plots as we would for an ordinary linear regression model. So in this particular case, I guess the residuals don't appear that flash. There's some evidence that the variability is higher at lower fitted values than um, larger fitted values, and there does appear to be perhaps an, an outlier or two. But on the whole, then they're not too terrible. Okay. Let's now have a go at analyzing this data using a hierarchical generalized linear model. So once again, you can open this menu two different ways. You can go stats, regression analysis, mixed models, and then pick HGLMs from there. Or from stats, you can go straight to mixed models and then find hierarchical generalized linear models there. So I click that to open that menu. So our response variable is tillers, so I'll just add that into the response variable field. And if you recall, um, like with GLMMs, HGLMs enable us to model more than one source of random variation. However, unlike GLMs, these additional random terms are not constrained to follow a normal distribution, nor to have an identity link. Now, by selecting in this model type drop-down conjugate HGLE model, the conjugate distribution to the distribution of the response variable will be used for the random effects. And for both the fixed and random models, the canonical link function will be used. So if we set our distribution of the response variable tillers to the assume distribution normal, oh sorry, the assume distribution for son, 
the distribution of the random model will automatically change to gamma, which is the conjugate distribution to the Poisson distribution. And the link function for both the fixed and random models will be automatically set to the canonical link. And that's the natural logarithm. Now we just have to define the fixed model, which is, once again, Coldivar by endophyte by insect, and the random model, which is just a replicate. And we can open our options menu and select what output we would like to display. I'm just going to display um, a description of the model, um, the likelihood statistics, and the wall statistics. And once again, I'm going to estimate the dispersion parameter rather than fixing it at one. And everything else, I'm just going to leave at the GenStat default. So now we can click OK and run, and our HGLM is fitted, and here's the output showing. Now, these likelihood statistics, they deserve a special mention as they can help us assess various components of the model. So for example, this adjusted profile likelihood statistic here can be used to assess changes in the fixed model. Now you can learn more about these various likelihood statistics in Roger's e-learning course that I mentioned earlier, and also in the GenStat House. I'm not going to discuss it in depth here today, unfortunately, because I don't have time. And we've also got the wall tests, um, which provide another quicker but sometimes less accurate way of seeing whether terms can be dropped from the model. Now this wall test um, suggests that there's no three-way interaction. So let's just drop it from a model and see how much the adjusted profile likelihood um, changes. Now to remove the three-way interaction from a model, the easiest approach is to go into the options and change the factorial limit from three to two. This will mean only interactions up to the order of two will be fitted in the model. Consequently, therefore, the three-way interaction won't be. Another way of doing it is we could simply type in the fixed model field, negative, cultivar, uh, dot, endophyte, dot, inset to explicitly remove the three-way interaction term from the model formula. And last but not least, of course, you could write out the model formula in full, containing all the various terms you want to fit. Um, but as you can imagine, this is quite um, laborious. So using these kind of shortcuts um, is a lot easier. OK, so let's click Run and see how much our likelihood statistic changes. The model has just ran there. So in the full model, um, the likelihood statistic we're interested in is 577. When we drop the three-way interaction, it changes to 579, so a change of about two. And also the number of parameters in the full model in the model, sorry, I've changed by one um, from eight in the full model to now seven in this reduced model. Therefore, this change of two in the log likelihood statistic has a chi squared distribution on one degree of freedom because there's a change in the number of parameters of just one. As the critical value at the 5% level for the chi-squared 1 distribution is approximately 3.8, this means that this change is not significant. So we probably can safely drop the three-way interaction term from our model. So scrolling, looking at the bottom of our output, here are the um, walled tests from this reduced model. 
And once again, it appears that well, there's an endophyte by insect interaction, but it doesn't look like there's much happening um, between the different cultivars. Now we could of course continue the process of dropping terms and testing their significance using the change in adjusted profile likelihood, but I'm going to leave that um, for another day. And just a quick note for those of you that use the GenStat command line, there is actually a procedure called HGF test um, that will perform these likelihood tests for fixed effects for you. So you don't have to go through the manual process of dropping a term, working out what the change in the likelihood statistic is, working out um, what the p-value for the corresponding chi-square distribution is. You can just use this um, procedure instead. Okay, and I guess just quickly as for GLMs and GLMMs, we also have a predict menu, so you can predict the means that you're interested in. You can also save um, output that you want and produce um, further output as well. Now, as I alluded to earlier, the telecounts are actually censored. As I'm sure you can imagine, counting tillers on a plant is very time consuming and a bit of a thankless task. So what happened is when the researchers got to 200 tillers on a particular plant, they stopped counting and simply noted that the plant had at least 200 tillers. Consequently, our observed tiller data here is right censored at 200. Now, one of the many developments in GenStat 23 is the ability to analyze censored Poisson count using either a log linear model, a generalized linear mix model, or a hierarchical generalized linear model. Now, in all of these menus, there is a tick box for censored counts. So when you have censored data, all you have to do is tick this box and then use the radio buttons below to indicate whether your Poisson count data is left or right censored. In our example, till accounts were not taken above 200, therefore they are right censored. And finally, you just enter the bound, um, which your data is censored at, into the corresponding field. Now, uh, before fitting this HGLM um, with censored counts, let's just open the options. And I'm going to select to print out the estimates of the censored observations in my output. So nothing else changes. Click OK and run and my HGLM now for censored counts has been um, fitted. It takes a little bit longer because the works through an EM algorithm to deal with the censoring. Lovely. So that's just one of the new features we've introduced in GenStat 23. And actually in GenStat 24, we're going to have more tools to deal with many more different types of censored data, not just um, person counts. All right, now I've just got a little bit of time. I just wanted to very quickly um, look at analysis of binomial data. So I'm just going to restart my GenStat session to clear out all the old data and that output. Now the example data set I'm going to use is called GT not 2000. And this is from a split pot trial of cultivar by fungicide. The variable of interest is LM plants. This is the number of fungus infected plants within a plot of N plants. So that is, we've got binomial data. So let's model this using a conjugate binomial HGLM 
with a logic link. So first, just going to reopen that HGLM menu. Here we go. And I'm going to make sure the model type field is um, set to conjugate HGLM and then set the distribution of the response to binomial. So our response variable is LM plants and the binomial titles are in plants. Now the fixed model is cultivar by, by fungicide. And the random model reflecting the split plot design is block and whole plot within block. So this backslash operator means that whole plot is nested within block, meaning that we're fitting a term for block and then we're fitting the block dot whole plot interaction. Okay, so over in the option tab, yep, let's estimate dispersion, we'll get the all tests again. And for a bit of variation, let's get the estimates of the um, fixed model parameters and the estimates of dispersion as well. So when you're happy with that, just click OK and run. And it is as easy as that to analyze um, binomial data. And of course, we can get predictions out um, if we'd like. Sorry, I double clicked on it. That's why it beeped at me again if we would like, and we can get further output. So for example, if I plot the residuals this time, you'll see that actually um, for this model, they are looking pretty nice. Excellent, well, um, thank you very much um, for attending um, this seminar. That um, brings me to the end of the material I wanted to present. Um, if you have any questions, um, please do feel free to ask now or um, you're more than welcome to contact me um, later um, via email. And yeah, just a quick reminder, if you want a more in-depth course looking into GLMMs and HGLMs, I really do recommend um, you checking out Roger's e-learning um, seminar. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you, Vanessa. Check I'm not on mute. No, I'm not on mute. Um, yeah, as I say, we're going to be sending you all um, recording. Feel free to share this with your colleagues. And we'll also be giving you a 30 day access to Roger's GLM course. Um, yeah, so, so get on that um, as soon as you can. I've had one question here, Vanessa, um, on interval sensor data. How would we manage for that? Or is that something we're planning to add to GenStat in the future? Ah, interval censoring. So, so is this in the context of um, survival analysis? Because I don't know, I'm afraid that's all I've got on it. So let's let's well, assume, let's assume well, so. So if it is and related um, to survival analysis, yes. Um, in fact, we're we're currently working on some tools for that, and we hope to get that in um, GenStat 24. Yes. Brilliant. Correct answer. <laughs> oh, and actually, no. And uh, if it's the other form of censoring now, which, which I think that the, the person actually meant, where you've got um, either censoring at both ends or you've got um, different observations could be censored um, at different points, then again, the answer is yes. This is something that we are currently um, working on and that will definitely be in GenStat 24. Perfect, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Well, yeah, as Vanessa says, any questions you, can, you do think of um, post webinar, please send these to us. We'll be happy to answer them um, in the reply, in the response. Again, thank you for joining us, Vanessa. Thank you for the presentation. Really helpful, really informative, as always. Um, and yeah, we'll follow up with you guys shortly. Thanks so much. Thank you.